Meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, sehr herzlich willkommen bei einem weiteren spannenden Anlass des Schweizerischen Instituts für Auslandforschung in diesem bewegten Herbstsemester 2021. Dear ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome here again with the Swiss Institute for International Studies at Zurich University. My name is Martin Mayer, I'm the chairman of the Institute. I'm very proud to present tonight our new format again, CIAF Talks, our live stream directly from the Swiss Re Center for Global Dialogue in Brüschlikon, close to Zurich. Thank you very much for this great cooperation. After highly interesting and successful evenings at Zurich University as well as from here in the studio with distinguished speakers like Neil Ferguson, Ilif Shafak, Christian Lindner, Anne Applebaum, Federal Council Alain Berset and Federal Council Viola Amherd, we are glad to present you as our special guest, the Chairman of the Board of Directors Nestle, Mr. Paul Bulke. Welcome, Paul. Thank you. Paul Bulke is certainly one of the most distinctive entrepreneurs and managers of today. He was born in 1954 in, uh, in Belgium and is a Belgian and Swiss citizen. He studied at the University of Louvain from 1972 to 1976, started then his career as a financial analyst and joined Nestle already in 1979. He had diverse functions for the company in South America, Portugal, Eastern Europe, and Germany, and became chief executive officer of Nestle in 2008. A position he held till 2017, when he became chairman of the board of directors as the successor of Peter Brabeck. Paul Bulke, who holds also other important mandates, is very much committed to politics, to culture, the sciences, and all aspects of life which are fundamental for our societies. Therefore, he is the perfect guest to be interviewed for our institute by Dr. Katja Gentinetta, whom I do not have to introduce anymore. In short, we are very excited and look forward to a manifold conversation. I wish us a great evening. Thank you for your attendance. Thank you very much, Martin. Mr. Bulke, you're at the head of the world's largest food company, which is doing well year after year, and this for more than 150 years now. What's the secret of this long-lasting success? Well, there's quite a few elements uh, coming together there. Uh, first, I think we are a company that, that always think long-term. We have a long-term strategy. Uh, that's one. Uh, we have also uh, long-term uh, serving people in the company. And uh, we are, in, in that sense, also very consistent in time. Um, but also we have, we are not in a bad sector. Uh, food and beverages per se is a good sector where, where you have a certain stability in many challenges, but a certain stability. We have a good strategy in there, a strategy that, that really uh, survives the short term. Uh, our strategy is really understanding uh, food and beverages, nutrition, and how it is linked with health, and how that is part of, of global wellness of, of uh, individuals and family. Um, we are a company with a strong company culture. Uh, we do have strong explicit values. And another element that helps us to go through this is that we have a certain, I would say, combination of, of different categories and, and, and we are very decentralized. Uh, so we have a natural hedge somewhere. Uh, so we don't suffer these, these very nervous moods of specific products or specific countries. So all these elements together, um, think, uh, 
are one of the main reasons. And one other thing is that we are there for the company and not the reverse. That mm -hmm. helps too. We're going to talk about your size, we're going to talk about your sustainability, your long-term success. But starting from a very basic point, I mean, you said you're not in a bad um, industry. Food is quite important. I mean, everyone, everyone needs food. Do you have an idea of how many people buy Nestle products on a daily basis? And what market share that is? Yeah, well, um, there are quite a few uh, people uh, in certain countries. We Basically, our, our penetration in the families of our products, like in Brazil, is over 90%. So our products are to be found almost in every household. But to give you an idea, we, we, we sell over 1 billion products a day. Um, and we produce them uh, in our factories. And you have to, 1 billion uh, a day. And so that's a lot. So we do touch many, many consumers a day. Um, and yet, at the same time, uh, being the biggest player in the packaged food business, uh, we're not even 3%. Uh, we are small, you see, uh, because this is a very, a very split, atomized world, uh, uh, the food and beverage industry, which is, to a certain extent, uh, a motivation. We have a long way to go. Uh, so your, your aim is to be far more than 3%. <laughs> well, it's not a matter of... Uh, of how big you are in, as per se, as an objective. What we do want to do, though, is growing mm -hmm. and growing further and, and, and being more relevant. And, and on, on that nutrition equation, uh, using signs and, and translate that into products and services and, 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 and exploring new venues, too. That's how Nestle Health Science that we have created now 10 years ago, um, but we were engaged in that already much, much before. So it is actually... Yeah, being useful and, and, and meaningful uh, to people's lives in a, in a society that is on nutrition quite challenged. Yes, we want to do that. If we just look at one trend which is quite important, I mean, healthy food is important for everyone, but there are some very special trends such as vegan food. More and more people are just trying to avoid everything that comes from animals. Not only meat, fish, but everything. And that's why you're heavily investing in plant-based proteins. How far is this trend going? What do, you, what do you think? Is this going to shift the nutrition sector, the food overall? Or is it going to be going to stay a trend with a minority that might be growing, but it will stay a minority? First, it's a trend that's there. That trend is there to stay. Uh, it's not going to be small uh, because it has so much arguments and promise. Um, it's not something that jumped on the scene in the last year or two, and that's it. It has uh, vegetable protein is something that our company has been working on for quite a while. Uh, it's jumped on the scene when you start saying, hey, we can replace a burger, because that's like easy to understand. Hey, a replacement of meat, per se. But think about, uh, first of all, the mindset of people. People are much more aware about uh, uh, healthy, and they give to vegetable proteins, healthy dimensions, uh, environment, meat, uh, and vegetable proteins. The difference is one to ten, give and take, on environment. And, and so they want to know where it comes from and, and, and things like that. So you have another consumer and that's not going to change. Uh, so they're going to stay there. So you can offer, so it's not a short-term fad. Uh, second, that environmental dimension is going to somewhere guide us towards more vegetable proteins. That's for sure. They're, first of all, healthy arguments for this, but definitely uh, uh, sustainability dimensions coming. And that's why you have to weave it in into that context for that. It is something that is uh, important to us. Uh, not only now has been, but uh, has intensified dramatically. It's not only meat replacement. Uh, think about, we have, for example, tuna. We can give you a tuna experience with, uh, with vegetables, as we call it vuna, and it's working very well in Europe. Uh, Eggs, we call it veggie, V, ve, vegetable, and egg, E. Uh, so um, some creativity there too, but, but it's possible. And while it is possible, we should not leave that opportunity as also serving climate uh, in that sense. Does it mean that we are against meat per se? No, I think we should give the choice, and, 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 and that's the richness of, of and, and motivation of being in a business like this. Mm. 
But what is the what is the vision at the end? Are cows and sheep completely uh, disappear from our mountains and from our nature? No, we're not going to change the landscape of Switzerland, please. Okay. So, <laughs> but mind you, in Switzerland, uh, give and take, we what is it per, per capita? Six, uh, 50 kilograms of meat per per year. Per year, that means one kilogram a week. That's quite a lot. Is it sustainable per se? Uh, um, and yet, that may reduce, and more consumers are going to put some vegetable arguments in their diet. Yet, at the same time, the world is changing also elsewhere. People are, that don't have meat are going to go in. But I feel we, we have to see uh, what we want to be as a company that do have these offerings. And mm -hmm. that's what uh, matters to us. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and looking, it's not a matter of only replacing uh, um, proteins by, by vegetable proteins. You have to watch out to maintain the same nutritional profiles of things. And nutrition is, is more complex than that, and that's where we're good at. So we, I think we can make a difference. You already mentioned healthy food, and this is very important for you, and for many people it's very important as well. And you grow, this is the, one of the fast growing sectors within your company. You're growing also by uh, mergers and acquisitions, such as vitamins, anti-allergics, and so on. How healthy is your food? It's healthy really? because... Indeed. <laughs> no, but look, food, uh, product by product, what is healthy? a uh, healthy product? Uh, I think we are definitely having a portfolio of products that are part or can be part of a healthy diet. Healthy diets and healthy lifestyles are linked with also uh, instructed people who can make choices. Us delivering products that do have uh, uh, reduced sugar or sodium, and we have done that over the years, and, and we go further in there. So the products, uh, portionability, uh, but having consumers transparent, transparency on the label and consumers who can discern and decide for themselves also on the healthy diets. So at the end, um, um, there's so much opportunity still to go further, and science helps there. Um, we're actually exploring also this whole Nestle Health Science, which is the, the different new needs of society. Think about urbanization, what it all brings with it. Um, you have also uh, uh, allergies. Uh, that is all um, uh, new, more, more prominent uh, part of society. We can, through nutrition, answer these needs Yet at the same time, we have science gives us the answers. Uh, think about the healthcare sector that is actually exploding cost. Well, we want to be part of health, uh, helping our society to keep its population healthy, inducive health rather than therapeutic corrective health. Um, and, 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 and work on these issues is, is, is just very, very motivating. Think about older, uh, the, the aging of our population. Aging, older people do have different nutritional needs. Um, so we, we can gear our offerings towards these people in, in different ways. Think about older, older people that do have uh, problems to swallow and it goes into the lungs. We can shape and produce products or uh, the condition products that do have a viscosity that allows not, not that to happen. Many older people are getting uh, um, bronchitis because of food. Uh, so, um, but that's already uh, this whole new area of exploring new venues. And it's by no means Nestle moving from what we are towards that. What we do is keeping that going well and exploring these no new dimensions that are um, needed by society and allowed by science. But if you, if you just show it like this, we're not, we're not going away from there, but we're moving there. Where does, uh, for you, food ends and health starts? I mean, do you have, do you have a feeling for that? Do you, do you, do you have a vision of a, of a health company in the end, which is producing health through food? No, because uh, there is no such thing as where do you have food and where does health start? Mm -hmm. Food is part of healthy lifestyle. I have to remind you, without food you die, so it's definitely something that is part of your health. Um, but then do it right and we have to be part of that. So, and it's daily food, daily. And so uh, we, we don't want to be a company that goes only for people with special nutritional needs. We want to be part of people's lives in general and be part of... Uh, because food is health, 
Food is also how you do it. It's responsible towards uh, uh, environment. Food is also enjoyment. Food is also social. And, and being able to be part of that, uh, and having a, a good coffee break and, and, and allowing that to be added with a Kit Kat. It's, 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 look, that's part of, 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 of life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we want to be part of that and not only moving in an angle there where you start to be only uh, yeah, um, geared and engineered towards uh, being a solution for medical conditions. But one last question to food. I mean, we know that in general, fresh food is much more healthy than convenience food. And what you produce is convenience food. And we know that in there is lots of sugar, lots of salt, lots of additives that can produce health problems or at least are not necessary for us. So where is Nestle going in this way? Because we know many people who are just looking what's the sugar additive in there and they try to avoid. Yes, but as you put it, it's actually dramatic. <laughs> many and, people put it like that. <laughs> that's true and that's a little bit uh, stereotyping. I must say also when I say Fresh is the paradigm of all what is healthy. It depends on what you eat as fresh. But if I um, put in a frozen food plate or uh, that we have quite a bit also in the United States, I, I put a carrot in that was taken from the field six hours later, it's frozen. It's the fr most fresh you can have. I mean, so, and that's yet also packed and, and very convenient and in COVID times, super convenient and so convenience per se doesn't mean something that is bad per se what it does it adds a layer of reason why uh, and, and and many lifestyles are thankful to have kinds of products that's why we sell them also because some people buy them that does mean that we are against all fresh uh, it's a combination of both so we have lots of products that do allow you to go fresh think about the bouillon cube where i actually allow you or, or, or other ingredients, the flavor world we call that, uh, to condition and make you uh, and, and give you some help in the kitchen to co cook fresh food for your family. So uh, it, it's not exclusive one with another. And, and, and I must say this, this packed food is not only for convenience, it locks in also all the nutrients and brings them to your table uh, with all the qualities of nutrients. Uh, so uh, I think it's, um, it's a little bit of a, what it does is stereotyping does make you think. And you say all this processed food is full of A, B, C, and D. Well, when it is true, and it is to a certain extent in certain areas, well, we correct or we reduce. Um, it is so that 20, 30 years ago, uh, calories were lacking in society and then it went straight away to the other side, and not only that, it was also nutrient poor products, not only calories, nutrient poor uh, products. So it's for us to use our knowledge and insights and science to see how we can combine, how can we reduce sugar, for example. Let me give you an example. Here in Switzerland, Nesquik cereals. Uh, in the last year, the, uh, we have NutriScore because also transparency, being clear on your label. Uh, we had in this, in this quick uh, series that was Nutri-Score classified D. Yeah. Red, so deep red. You're informed. <laughs> um, so not good. And, and now it's A. It's good. Very good. And <laughs> Great. We reduced, we reduced sugar there 40% and sodium by 70%. It's possible. You have to have knowledge. You have to work on this. You have to see because also it should be enjoyable. So uh, I think this whole equation of, of um, classifying good or bad, per se, is something we have our responsibility to make sure that all our brothers can be a driving force of good, healthy, balanced diets. And uh, so much has been done uh, already, so much can be done still. And that's one of our responsibilities. And also differentiator. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We can make a difference there by doing it right. So it's actually a an opportunity for us. By the way, can you enjoy a meal without scanning what you eat, without thinking of your business and saying, oh, this is too much of this and we could no, do that better? Yeah, I that? can. Can you just enjoy a meal like that? I can relax. Uh, 
whenever I use Nestle products, I'm relaxed. <laughs> and when you don't have them at your disposition, then what? <laughs> Look, at the end of the day also, you, you, we should not have nutritional anxiety permanently. I think uh, somewhere, uh, well, we're in that industry, but, but, but a balanced lifestyle in general is not a bad thing. And uh, we should not be anxious permanently. Uh, that's why also these labels and I'll help you somewhere to steer uh, but watch out not to fall in the trap of, 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 of having that and, uh, uh, and being very anxious and then on the rest having a totally unhealthy lifestyle somewhere else. I mean, it's a bit of, uh, yeah, like everything, balance. It's life. also an individual So I try to be yes. balanced in life on these uh, issues <laughs> and just sometimes you have your steak or something like that. Enjoy it then. And, <laughs> um, and a glass of wine, although uh, you see. It's a matter of balance. Let's have a look at your business uh, at a larger scale. You're um, committed to creating shared value. It's a management concept that was created something like 30 years ago from Porter and Kramer, management gurus, so to say. You put it in your statutes, more or less, to you're committed to long-term value creation. Um, you were at Nestle for more than 40 years. And this concept was in, implemented 20 years ago. Did you, real, did, you, did you experience a change within the business due to this no. concept? No, let me, somewhere, 15 years ago, Creative Share Value, 2006, we tested. Uh, so, so the articulation of how we go about what we do was new then. Mm -hmm. That's Creative Shared Value was like an uh, academic articulation of what you may call now stakeholder uh, uh, capitalism and all these. But that's something that Nestle has done from the onset, 155 years ago. And uh, so I didn't see all of a sudden, hey, we have a new idea, let's work differently. What it was, was saying and explaining and articulating how we went always about business. By doing so, actually, you articulate in such a way that you get more and stronger alignment uh, in, in the organization, because you give it somewhere a, a framing. So a company has to define three things. That, uh, that's the what, the how, and the why. The what is nutrition, health, and wellness. Understanding the strategic dimension, uh, direction of the company, and what it means, and how you translate in products and services, and etc. The how is creating share value. How we go about our, our activities. And that means, uh, actually, to explain uh, creating a shared value is this conviction that the company to be to be successful over time means creating shareholder value over time. To be successful over time has to create value not only for shareholders but for all uh, uh, partners and dimensions of society. Now, Nestle is by 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 the products we sell uh, or produce. Uh, healthy products uh, done uh, in local communities. So we include economical um, uh, development in these communities in our uh, creating share value. Having stable jobs and, and well-prepared uh, um, employees and, and, and then also engaging in the societal discussion about certain topics. Uh, that all is working with farmers. We are working with 600, 650,000 farmers directly and millions indirectly. All that is creating share value. And this is, this is a, a, a feel of, a, but on you, I learned that at my university, it was mentioned that I, in Louvain, we, that's a Catholic university, so we had morale philosophy of economical activity. And the thing was, look, at uh, uh, economical activity, uh, well-defined, doing the right uh, uh, products and all that, or services and all, should be a driving positive force in society. So somewhere that brings it back. That's this whole uh, multi-stakeholder mm -hmm. capitalism, the same thing. It is going forward to basic somewhere. Yes, it is basic. But the way you put it now, one could argue that you're putting it forward the way you do. You report on it, creating shared value every year, and it didn't really change your business. So is it, it, only, is it only a marketing tool? No. Oh, smart question. <laughs> Uh, no, no, it doesn't. Uh, 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 per se, what it, what it does, though, it is frames it well so it can channel even better all what we do in, in, in that direction. In a time where society is more intensively 
asking that from companies to say, hey, answer us that worry. Think about the ESG now, this whole environmental, social and, and governance dimensions. Well, creating shared value is, is somewhere framing this for us in, in these questions. What it allows to happen is to engage more forcefully. Look, the net zero roadmap that we have uh, articulated and communicated the last year and the, at the end of last year. No, it was before we promised and then we have a roadmap. This comes about in a way that answers a specific question we have on our table. Hey, Nestle, what are you doing? And uh, so it doesn't, it's not that we all of a sudden started to think about our, our, our greenhouse gas emission that day. We have been thinking about that for quite a few years. But what it does, there's a catalyzer of, of discipline, of transparency, of measuring, which is still challenging for mm -hmm. because so many measurements, but still. And that roadmap uh, that we announced on Net Zero is something that we have worked one year just to see what do we do already? How can we, how do we get there? And, and have uh, specific commitments. Um, all these things are much more, I would say, uh, channel now. Uh, and our creating share value that we did before is, is, is a very good articulation and framing of all these efforts. Mm -hmm. Look, when we started, I started my career in Peru, 1980. Um, and that was one of the best examples of creating share value. We didn't name it like this, but that was when Shining Path was very active and, and, and uh, very unstable, uh, quite, quite dangerous. And, and we were young and motivated, so we went there. And uh, Nestle stayed. Many, many companies left. That staying, we had in Cajamarca in the north over a milk district. We had so many farmers, thousands of farmers delivering milk, staying. Well, that's creating shared value. We are, um, so uh, we are still in Venezuela. Uh, yes, I mean, that, this is one other very interesting story. You have uh, 700, no, how many? Um, you have 376 factories in 81 countries, and I have there countries such as Lebanon, Syria, Libya, Nigeria, Mali, Central African Republic. I mean, this, these are all countries where you stay, where you are. We know these uh, countries from the news, from the bad news. <coughs> These are countries where, just to say, the ICRC is active. So not very easy countries, really countries with, uh, with conflicts, with unstable politics. Life and for easy. you, there is enough reason to stay there, enough business but, reason to uh, stay there. Yes. Yes. Th think about, um, you engage in a country, you start, you have uh, relationships with farmers, you have your consumers, you have your factories. Uh, so we are engaging in, in these communities or countries uh, in good times and bad times. Uh, this long-term view comes through uh, a bit there also. And uh, whenever we can, and we sh uh, there are certain conditions though, when the safety of our people are challenged and then you start, then no. Mm -hmm. But when we can safeguard that and we can live up to our promise of producing good, healthy uh, food products. And we can do that in the framing of our values uh, and principles. Then we stay. And uh, uh, we, we, we are there also, our, our, our employees, uh, I use the example of, of Venezuela. Mm -hmm. We have 2,500 employees still on the payroll, five factories. Uh, we have a lady managing it and, and uh, chapeau. Uh, you have to do it. It's not easy, but and, and but. But also but, for a man, it wouldn't be easy. It's for for. It's not <laughs> easy in general. It's not easy for the two thousand five hundred people there, and uh, she is leading that. So chapeau. But but uh, to rewire permanently your supply chains and things like that in an environment that is not uh, the most stable, and yet you do it. Two thousand five hundred people. They have their livelihood. They 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 trust it. They they believe in you. Uh, we have all these consumers on, and, and still have products on the shelves. If sometimes you don't have too many of them. And, uh, and, and so many farmers linked with our activity. And so that's creating shared value. I can tell you it's not for business that you're there for the time being. But, but 
that's that's how we are, and we have done that, and we are in many other countries just like that. At the end, uh, but mind you, there, there's to a certain extent a dimension of self-interest too, because our brands are still there, our brands are still there, our consumers have them there. There is emotion of uh, we are part of their uh, societal fabric and staying there in good and bad times. Uh, look, it serves as well. It is linked with our convictions. That's the right, right thing to do. And it is linked with your first question. How do you? How are you successful over time? It is by, by not flip-flopping and uh, being there when it's good, uh, going out. It is this consistency in time that, that I feel we should privilege under these conditions of safety. And uh, there you go. This is not for us, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you report on your creating shared value, you explained what it is. And now you also report on the SDGs and the sustainable development goals. To be concrete, you report on 11 out of these 17 goals, uh, which is your contribution to, to a better, to a sustainable world. Are the two necessary now or is it a bit too much? Or mean, are you, were you with your creating shared value just earlier than the other ones? It's not a race. I don't care if you're earlier or not. It's how you live it. Uh, we have articulated like that. And, and no, we're not saying, hey, I don't like this term. It's our term that stands out, etc. What it did was it explains and it has articulated for ourselves internally and externally uh, how the how of our company. And creating shared value per se is not the easiest term for broader communication either. Uh, I mean, mm. ESG isn't either. Uh, so, but it's very common now. I mean, there is hardly a big company which doesn't report on on the SDGs. Yeah, this but is a, is a common framework. Which but is one doesn't exclude the other. For us, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, actually, creating shared value as a more philosophical, broader articulation. ESG has three dimensions: it's the environment, social, and governance. So, and then you go, and we have still as as. Uh, as an industry or in general as economic as a society to to frame this better because uh, we still have um, quite a lot of uh, interpretations possible so we are trying and we are actively involved in trying to frame a bit better uh, have a common language what do you really measure how do you hence we uh, there's many other dimensions that we also measuring out of the ESG but that's going to fade in there too mm -hmm. so we are part of that uh, I would say uh, setting up of that uh, reporting. Uh, we have been reporting, uh, we called it then, and still are, creating share value reporting back on these different, on water and social and, and, and nutrition. Child uh, labor. Child labor also. We have, All these issues. Yeah. And, and I mean, at the heart of this is not only what you do good, but the heart of that is that not only NGOs are looking what companies of your size are doing abroad, but also the regulatory board bodies are focusing on it the more. And we know that the, um, there there is also a regulation growing on this issue, on your supply chain questions. We know very well that you were against the Swiss law, against the Swiss initiative, business uh, responsibility initiative, which the Swiss uh, resigned one year ago. The people said yes, the canton said no, that's why it wasn't accepted. But now, at the European level, there is also a law being shaped on this, and we know that you are in favor of that law. So where's the difference between the law in Switzerland and the law? Well, they're not the same. The they're not the same. And, and still, there, there, there were some... First of all, that in Switzerland there was a counter-proposal. Um, um, so we were not against, uh, we were for something, the counter proposal as such. The, uh, when it goes too far and it is actually well intended, but at the end it would have unexpected uh, consequences, then, uh, and it would be counterproductive, then we're not for. And uh, so we have been quite explicit to that because that would have been a little bit of a modern witch hunt um, uh, per se, because if you have extended supply chain, so you are responsible for what you know by far not can control. You can you can try to have look at transparency all what you want, but control is something else. But you're still responsible for it, and you have the reverse of burden of proof. So you have to prove you permanently your innocence for whatever may come up. Then we were saying, hey, uh, oh well, no well intention, but that's not that's not 
feasible, not workable. And uh, so that's why, I mean, so we're not against the fact that some regulation comes in, some framing, actually we for it to say, hey, orchestrate this a bit better. But you're also convinced that you, don't, you cannot regulate yourself to glory. It's like if I want to regulate honesty, I, I would ask you, write me down what honesty is, you're gonna be writing your whole life and not getting there, so don't even start. So somewhere, uh, and that's, Somewhere, but that's a philosophical question. We have to maintain a certain balance so that uh, everything is not asphyxiatingly governed and regulated uh, and, and still give, give space and, and, and a responsible behavior somewhere too. So that's a little bit of a philosophical discussion. But, yes, um, I'm, I'm, I'm with you that that's philosophical, but in the end, with these regulatory shapings, it's about taking to court. Can, can companies like you be taken to court for whatever happens in wherever of we your already, situations? We can already. If, if there is proof and all that, and it is proven that A, B, C, and D, even in Switzerland, uh, for sure, for sure, that, that can already be done. Uh, and so what does the European regulation change for you if you, if you don't fear it? <laughs> Well, it's, made, it's making it much more explicit uh, in that sense. Uh, it, is, it is framing and obliging and reporting. So that's not there yet, uh, this, this full reports on. And, and so that, that's basically yeah, going in that direction. Germany has it already. Didn't go as far as what we had on the table mm -hmm. in Switzerland. Uh, France went through the same exercise. What they try now to do in Europe is saying, look, instead of every, let's, let's coordinate a bit better, which is better because Switzerland, and Sweden, uh, Europe per se, is, 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 uh, it's never good to have each country moving in another direction. And I think that's uh, the whole meaning of, uh, of, of Europe. And Switzerland, Switzerland aligning a bit there too is, is quite convenient. But if you look at this at, at, the, at the very concrete way, I mean, you're reporting on your creating shared value on the SDGs. Uh, we talked about uh, ESG, etc. Um, child, child labor is one issue. I mean, controlling your supply chains are other issues. Where do you think, from your point of view as a chairman, where do you have the greatest challenge? I mean, you have something like 290,000 people working worldwide for this company. You cannot control no. everybody of them. So where are your greatest concerns? No, it, it's always, a, a, when, when they ask me, what, is, what keeps you up at night? First mm -hmm. of all, sleep well and then answer. And, but, but, um, I just uh, asked myself whether you delegate it to your CEO. So. But there's one thing that we as a company, not even mm -hmm. me as a, as a but, but as a company, it is we are successful uh, only when there is trust. So the biggest challenge that we may have is that one of our products don't deliver on the promise of safety or something like that. Mm -hmm. So it is really the safety and quality of our products. Uh, that, that, that's the biggest challenge. Uh, and safety is something that, that is in uh, permanent redefinition because you can always, uh, the, the ways of detecting and, 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 and analyzing it is one thing. But trust now is much more complex than before. It is not only to have a safe product that uh, that's, um, uh, has a good flavor, it is also the questions that the consumers are asking, is it responsibly done, where it's coming from? And the biggest challenge is to, to, to really orchestrate that increased complexity. And I would even say more than complexity. It is also the ambiguity of things, because I, I, I have said it in other forums, but, but for me, the biggest challenge of leadership, be it political or or company-wide or whatever leadership in our society, is the ambiguity. And I explain ambiguous is, is, ambiguity is not uh, complexity and all that. Ambiguity is like what uh, was good is not good anymore, but it's not bad. What was, uh, uh, was, uh, what was sustainable is not sustainable, but, but it's not, uh, so uh, it's, you need judgment, increasingly judgment, to do the right things. Um, your question about politics, for example, to stay or not to stay. Mm -hmm, These are mm -hmm. ambiguous questions at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. What, and you, you need, you cannot analyze, uh, you have to have a judgment call 
and and that's the biggest challenge that I feel uh, we have to have uh, uh, to answer. As, and as the answer is not only on your level, but on every level, I, th I guess. That's that's important that you encourage your people to, to, yeah, sure. to give the answers. Sure, because we are decentralized. So I need a lot of judgment capacity in the markets mm -hmm. because the market head has to decide quite a lot of things. Not everything goes. Uh, um, uh, how do you, how, how, how do you uh, manage certain, certain tensions uh, in, in certain markets specifically as first answered locally? Uh, that's why we have to have a good framing of values so that these people can judge their uh, uh, judge their judgment and decision making mm -hmm. uh, so uh, and that's the biggest challenge i feel uh, all levels of management and leadership has ambiguity think it through it's no right answers what is right is not right anymore but wrong either think about that it's mm -hmm. not easy i mean another ambiguity is that uh, that you're let's say how you reported that you're really working hard to, to, to contribute to sustainability, yet you're still the bogeyman of whenever it, uh, we call talking about water issues, plastic issues, waste issues. Yeah. It's always Nestle, which is the, really the, the enemy of many people. Isn't yeah. that sometimes a bit frustrating or is there just a it's misunderstanding or a <laughs> well, is it no. that what keeps you awake? It's night? motivating, sometimes frustrating. <laughs> at the end, motivating. We are, we are a sizable company. Uh, we are, uh, as they say in my country, high trees, they do catch more wind. And, uh, and, but we're also an industry that is fairly understand, under, understood by people. Uh, you, you, you have a piece of chocolate and you hear about child labor and, hey, there you go. And, uh, or, or, or water, per se, for that matter, uh, which is in in, in plastic, and, 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 and there you go. And so we are, in that sense, exposed also by the understanding. People, if I would make, I don't know, but I would Well, be, sneakers, clothes, everyone. everyone yeah, 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 but there, uh, you know, first of all, that's a little bit of the intensity you feel in Switzerland, because we're a Swiss company, and the Swiss do have that quality of criticizing first what is close to them, and that's, that's why, and uh, so, but Maybe that's, not only the Swiss. <laughs> Yeah, but just to have a guess. Uh, that's a little bit. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I come in from another small country that criticizes <laughs> a lot of law. But uh, you see, we, 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 we are better, more exposed to that. And yet at the same time, that keeps us, keeps us awake uh, mm -hmm. and alert to, to really go for these things. We have permanent feedback in front of our door. Um, so look, at the end, uh, you cannot change this. That's going to happen. So you cannot wish it away. You better engage and have discussions. And we are engaged with many stakeholders on all these issues. And um, I, I think that's what a company f with a certain dimension of leadership should do. And that's no, um, I must say, uh, somewhere also, this, this size and all allows us to act on it too. So the capacity of doing things for our company is, is quite, is quite sizable. Uh, you see, um, when we speak about, uh, for example, net zero and say, look, we're going to go for minus 20 in 25, minus 50 in 30 and have milestones. And we're going to uh, we're going to connect with our farmers, 600, 700,000 farmers, uh, still a fraction. You remember the number, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. but still uh, I'm doing that then together with other colleagues uh, or partners and so you can move things. If we say plastic, pet, uh, the, the plastic bottles, we're going to lightweight them or we're going to look for, we have also the size to justify investments in there. We have now in Versailles Les Blancs, where we have in Lausanne, we have, we have our research center. We have now a special department there, one of four. So we add one department on packaging. And you can have 65 of the best scientists that are linked with other best scientists in the world. Think about how do you make behave uh, paper? You have, make it behave like plastic. Uh, so we can invest in there and then, uh, and then roll it out over um, many, uh, many categories. So, uh, the, yeah, look. We are challenged, and yet at the same time we are engaged mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, motivated. I mean, you, you, you write from yourself that you have the, the size, the scale and the reach to do something. That's how you frame your, your climate action plan. Uh, if we now look at the COP26, I just read the press release of, the, of Business Europe, which says, 
there was a lack of national pledges. And if I read that from Business Europe, I just ask myself, okay, if there are many companies of your size, of your reach, of your scale, isn't that a bit cheap just to ask, just to ask for the nation states to, to make the first step? Couldn't you, as, as a, you and your peers, go ahead and say, okay, our commitment is this, and we just help you states to, to come further, faster, and in a more efficient way? Do you have to wait for the state no, to regulate? But, uh, no, we, we don't have to and we don't. Uh, we, we have our, Nestle as a company, uh, has, has this, this you commitment. You have your climate action plan, yes. There's a commitment. Mm -hmm. We have uh, also an uh, association where it goes broader. Mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, quite a few of these. Uh, we have signed pledges and, um, and somewhere we, we, yeah, signing pledges is one thing. Doing something else. Doing so is, 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 mm -hmm. we, we are definitely in the doing mode. And, and, and I think that's not blah, blah, blah. No, uh, that's not blah, blah. <laughs> because we are going to commit three point... Uh, we're gonna we heard commit a lot three, of blah, blah. We're going to commit three point something mm -hmm. billion um, mm -hmm. in the next uh, till 25 to help to go further in this net zero. We have this whole uh, dimension uh, of, of uh, regenerative agriculture where we're going to invest one... Uh, Point two uh, uh, billion two, and so uh, doing is quite inspiring, and 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 trying to do that together with other companies, or with uh, uh, NGOs and countries, mm -hmm. or with is is in my eyes the most important thing. And um, uh, it is true that there's some frustration about pledges and things like that, but I think the doing is is uh, much more important, or inducing doing. And we do yes, that. that's what I'm. That's what I'm heading for. It's not about frustration. It's more about thinking of pledging is very important. Doing is very important. But I sometimes ask myself: Do companies of your size, and if if you put yourself together, couldn't have more pressure on politics also to move forward more quickly? But look, uh, uh, I, there, there are some wrong um, uh, ideas out there in the sense of oh, companies like ours, uh, they do have a lot of. Uh, Polit political might uh, or power, um, that's wrong. It's not like that. And uh, actually, size could be counterproductive of power in politics. Uh, so to a certain extent, watch out what you uh, uh, try to get. But uh, th we are not having that power. What we do have, though, is, is in the communities where we work, in the factory and the region where we work, with the farm, we have a lot of power of doing things. That's why on these pledges and things like that, we, we as a company, not the first to jump on a row, let's have a pledge. What we do is trying where we can act and get results and measurable dimensions and then bring along people. We're going to do the regenerative agriculture with the farmers and try to have youth interested in farming again too and, and, and things like that. That's concrete. And, and, and try to have that uh, spilled over into other companies doing the, but. And there's quite a few companies that we know. Um, it's actually a contradiction. That's ambiguity too. We are made to compete with the other guys, and more and more of the issues mm -hmm. we have obliges us somewhere to sit together. So that's quite a little bit of of of, of ambiguity. Of, uh, ambiguity, I must <laughs> say. But mm -hmm. look, uh, it is not us as companies to do what uh, countries and the, con the political authorities of countries should do. We are not going to replace them. We should not. No, and to be very way. honest on, on climate, there is more done by private sector than with governments. I guess now. so, I guess so. Because governments are somewhere and there are all kinds of interests and pressures and all that, and there's maybe a lack of leadership there. I, I'm not speaking for them, but don't oblige us to replace them. It's not about replacing. I mean, if you look again... Inspiring. At, uh, ins yes, yes. And, it's and forcing, a bit forcing. Yeah, but we're forcing, on, but, uh, we, we're forcing sometimes just, also on saying, hey, put your act together, decide, yes, no, or I mean, give me an... <laughs> class. What we would expect from these is, uh, pledges is one thing, mm -hmm. but can they put their act together to have a, a, a common framing on what environment, how are we going to measure certain things? Because we are tiered mm -hmm. apart by all kinds of measurements and all that. Can they not put their act together there? So we're doing quite a lot of pressuring there so that we can, uh, uh, we don't lose time 
and, and, and trying to mm -hmm. sort out all kinds of different regulations and all that. Some convergence of regulations on environmental thing. Wouldn't, uh, no, that's not a pledge. Mm. That's actually a, a quite, a, quite an ask from all sides. So we, we're pressuring there a bit. But if you look what, what the, the track record companies of your size and smaller companies and many companies have in, in lobbying, in lobbying governments in their, in their directions to specific laws. If you just turn this around and say, you're not lobbying anymore for your specific interest, but you're contributing to this huge issue and you're putting your pressure there. No, we don't lobby for our short-term self-interest if you know it's going against the, 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 the better for society. Let's assume that's over. So the question is now. For us it's over already. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, we mm -hmm. don't, I, we went out of associations that were lobbying for the self-interest uh, against the good for on food or, or, or ingredients or, or limits. So we went out there because we didn't want to be dragged in. If we have a, a, a conviction that nutrition, health and wellness strategy means also reformulating your process, doing the right things in the, in, in the framing of what's possible, we're not going to start lobbying to extend uh, the allowance for profit. Uh, forget it. We, that's, that's not us. Now, uh, so the lobbying for self-interest short term that goes against the logic of common good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's not part of our agenda. I know, I know. So, and the other way around? In what sense? Shaping that there is more framing, mm -hmm. but we, we're trying to have that. If I mentioned just before, hey, we, we, we actually would like to see governments uh, have some convergence of ESG. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If there's a convergence of ESG, there's more obligation to us because you cannot hide behind the confusion anymore. But we don't suffer the confusion either. So we're for that. So actually in this, uh, we, we are engaged with... You're engaged with the WEF, for example, in this, in this for, issue. For example, but also when we are engaged in, the, in, in, in societal discussions on certain initiatives in Switzerland. That's also, uh, that's not lobbying. This is trying to uh, have our voice heard. It's engaging with the broader society again because I feel companies and business in general has been absent from the societal discussion. We were like, yeah, afraid to, do, to engage. We are proud of what we do. We criticize from all angles. Yes, let's engage and talk. Mm -hmm. And we didn't do that too much in the last uh, so many years. The financial crisis and all that uh, mm -hmm. somewhere gave us uh, some, some, I don't know what, uh, a little bit of reserve to be present, to be visible. But I think we should re-engage again much more explicitly in the, in, in the societal discussion on certain subjects that touches us. We should not be talking about other dimensions that are not touching our uh, reality in society, but what touches our reality in society. Companies, big and small, are a, a positive force. There's something good in society. That link we lost somewhere. Because also it's human. You get to a certain point of affluency and you forget what you brought there. And then you start criticizing. So it's logical. Uh, it's sometimes used also as political chips uh, by political parties. And so uh, at least uh, we should not give them a free ride if we're convinced of what we say and do. There, that's another, that's actually lobbying. If mm -hmm. you, in mm -hmm. the, yes. with the broader public. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If that's, well, then, uh, yeah, I'm going to lobby further. Or talk about this further. Would you, just, um, just as a last question, would you consider that corporate activism or is it deeper than that? Corporate activism. CEO activism. No. You know, in, in our world, activist, uh, activists and all that, they do have a little bit of a, maybe wrongly, a bad smell. So we, we don't want to be that. I mean, uh, it's more speaking out of conviction. Rather than activism, activism is with special, specific, no, it's no angled agendas. We don't do that. The, 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 our, our, our reality, our part of society is broader than that. Uh, what we have to do is being much more explicit in our engaging in societal discussions. Uh, that, that's not activism, that is being active, which is different. And uh, engaged, engaged is actually a good word, more engaged. Yeah, and all, and there's so many, think about the environment. Environment is there for a long, long time. But it jumped on the scene a few years ago. There was all of a sudden, and here and there, there's acceleration. Well, we have to engage. 
You asked me, is it sense that you have formulated or sense that there is ESG that you're active? And I said, no, we have always, always been there. But there's more intensity, more engagement. There's more questioning. There's more criticism. There's more intensity on all these issues. We should not be absent, and that's why we uh, are engaged in the discussion. That's why we are talking now today, too. So we're not talking for another 150 years, but Nestle is going to be there for one other 150 years. Well, look, that's the intention. I mean, as I say, long term, I feel uh, food and beverages, nutrition, it's uh, all the elements are there. So for us to continue on the journey. Thank you very much, Mr. Bulke. My pleasure. So let's have a look if there are questions from the online audience and or the audience in the room. I would like, Mr. Bulke, I think we talked about a bit, but you can may maybe precise it, to reflect upon the energy invested or more generally the footprint by the food production by Nestle compared to pure meat production or non-convenience food. But look, uh, if, if I understand the question well, it is that, that they ask, hey, you have still... Uh, uh, a footprint uh, from what you do and... Uh, a footprint on, on meat or, or... Yes, on meat. In, yeah. There's a huge footprint on uh, not only meat, uh, and meat we have sold off certain products that were meat-based, uh, meat, meat but, but um, if you think about milk is still an animal protein, and, and, and milk was a paradigm of goodness, and now all of a sudden, so there's a challenge conceptually too. I mean, um, milk is still very good for health, but, but, but it's, uh, there are new layers of dimension coming to it. Um, we are working, and I mentioned Wunder, which is this uh, uh, vegetable protein milk uh, drink that we have and all. If you say, what is the proportion of if I understand the question well, what is the proportion of all your business and then also the, uh, the, the meal or the, the animal or vegetable protein substitutes? Well, look, uh, on meat, meat it's 200, 250 million growing very fast, but uh, you go further and you have the drinks and you have et cetera. It's a, it's a give and take seven or 800 million. If I add also then, uh, so another product that's over one million, but it's growing fast. Now, that's not going to replace the rest. In that percentage of what we do, because we have other businesses that are totally not even in the equation of animal or not animal. Um, so, um, but I do believe it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a very, very prominent place in business and in argument for us. And uh, that's, that's how I see it. I mean, um, that's why we invest in it. Mm -hmm. Last question from here. Is Nestle too big to fail? Oh, no, you know, elephants fall, and when they fall, they don't stand up. Look, uh, 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 you, you know, um, no. That would be a, pre a presumptuous position, if you say, uh, too big to fail. This is a little bit of a buzzword that we heard sometimes in the last years and all. Um, we, 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 we are sizable because we add many small things together, and that's how we see ourselves. We are challenged, we engage in in taking up these challenges. We, we are very enthused for our future because we believe in our strategic direction. Uh, it's going to be a permanent move, permanent changing, reinventing, re-challenging ourselves and all. And uh, look, and we as a generation, we are there to uh, receive this company in quality A and give it away in quality A plus afterwards. And that's how we see it on a journey that lasts already 150 years and more. And as you mentioned, we want to be there in more than 150 years and uh, in different societies, surely, but adapted to it. So no state that needs to rescue you. Are there any questions in the room? Yes, there's one. Paul, this is a question I was asking uh, myself already for so long, so I'm really happy to ask it uh, to you directly. When you um, entered the market with uh, Nes, uh, not Nescafe, sorry, with Nespresso, um, went direct online, you kind of um, disrupted your own B2B business model in a way. How was that received by your distribution partners? 
Well, I'm going to answer with turning it around. We went with our capsules to uh, the distribution partners and they say, yes, welcome, but you have to di give discount A, B, C, and D that we didn't say, hey, that's not part of the model. So we were not welcome. And actually then uh, it's clear that afterwards, uh, some, so we can say that was, an, that was a strategic uh, strike of genius to have a direct-to-consumer model. It was actually an answer on not being accepted to start with. And, uh, but it was well played and afterwards, well organized, and that's how it is. Mind you, we are in that distribution channel with coffee. So we said, look, not this, but we have Nescafe. Yeah? So uh, <laughs> that worked, and we have been purist in that uh, for ever since. And, uh, and that's part of the landscape, so it's, there's no pressure. We had pressures, always. The success comes, hey, I want your capsules. If you don't give your capsules, you're not in your nest. But that's dealing and wheeling of, we're used to that. Uh, but the logic was different. And, uh, and uh, yeah, well done, I must say. This, hey, this story is 30 years, going to 40 years old. Eh? Uh, so it's uh, something that is uh, uh, established. Uh, but then you see, uh, also there we, we had then with, uh, with Dolce Gusto, we have then a capsule system that is in the retail. And that's the nicety about, uh, I would say, our strategy that we are in that uh, uh, warfare, call it warfare, but, but this, 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 this opportunity with different divisions, different brands, different propositions, and, and it actually is, adds up quite nicely. What it has given also to us is a very good insight of business to consumer, direct to consumer businesses, how you manage that. So it has given us some experience to extrapolate in other uh, areas. One more question there. Uh, Paul, thank you very much, first of all, for very fascinating insights you gave us. Uh, one question relating to uh, digital developments and e-commerce. How does e-commerce change your distribution system and your distribution perception? And, uh, you know, the, the digital approach to getting consumer goods. I mean, you, will you need to rely on department stores for selling your products? Well, it's clear that in food, it goes a little bit slower than in other kinds of products, uh, categories and all that's for sure. But, but it's there. And... Um, uh, so and, and it's growing fast. So we are an old channel company, so we're not saying, hey, it moves from two. Uh, the, but, and, and there is different assortments that work well on digital. Uh, think about Nestle Health Science, where you have people uh, with certain uh, vitamins or uh, minerals uh, supports, uh, uh, that there is more questioning and guidance, et cetera, that are direct to consumer. So that works better for these kinds of categories than, for example, Bouillon Cube, as such. Uh, so uh, we're monitoring that. Well, what we we want to be first in there in, in our industry. Uh, the percentage we have is, is growing. Uh, that's growing quite handsomely. Uh, um, so we see it more as complementary to uh, the, the, um, the classical, traditional distribution. You speak about big warehouses and, and things like that, but then think about the mom and pop stores. Uh, the reality there is, is, is different. And yet, you see, for example, and I think there's a huge opportunity in Africa, you don't have the Walmarts there or whatever on every corner. Uh, what you may have is all of a sudden some, some because they are linked with internet. It's amazing. And uh, you may have um, direct-to-consumer e-commerce uh, damage coming that you can order, and then there is a little truck coming on the, on the, on the village place, huh? and uh, you, you, your bag is there that you pay for, and that's it. So there's a huge opportunities of jumping stages. So what you're gonna see is that you're not gonna have the, the traditional stores, bigger stores, supermarkets, and all that of Europe or North America for that sake, in these kinds of countries, in the, in the, in the, in the rural areas. You're gonna jump from mom and pop store towards e-commerce in a different shapes and forms. You, every village truck comes in and what you ordered every Wednesday, you can have it in the, that's gonna work. If I were young, I would do a business there because it smells to me, it's like logical, but you jump a stage. So uh, 
and we have to be aware of. We are engaged there, uh, so we are with Amazon, yeah. We are with all the traditional that do have e-commerce, yes. But looking into these new small startups in certain parts of uh, Africa and others, that is quite promising and different. It's something you don't think of, but it's uh, quite promising. So one last question. <laughs> Thank you, and uh, good evening, uh, Paul. Thank you for, uh, for sharing. It was a very interesting dialogue. Um, food is, is very local, right? I mean, we, we love our food. There's, the taste is very different from country to country, yet you manage to sustain something very global with global brands that are recognized all over the planet. What's the, what's the way of, of uh, maintaining a global culture and at the same time being very local with food? operating model or, or decision making, even you said the, the company was very, very dispersed and, and very locally grounded. So how do you keep that balance? Well, look, first, uh, what, what we, we say internally, we are a global inspiration, local execution. So, but you have to have global inspiration. So don't let everybody and his brother everywhere in the market reinvent wheels or reinvent uh, the design of brands. Or We have 2,000 brands. But then you have, you have, you have hierarchy. Uh, we have glo global strategic brands, we have regional brands, we have local brands. So, and, and global strategic brands are general. Uh, it's corporate worldwide. But then again, you have Nescafe, global strategic brand. We have 150 brands of Nescafe. Because then again, we embrace local taste. Uh, and as we are decentralized, we have factories, uh, 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 quite decentralized, we, we can gear towards that uh, localness. And so that's a combination of both worlds then. We have, in that sense also, we have pushed decision making as close as possible to the consumer. Uh, we produce also with local ingredients, hence also all the supply chain challenges. Uh, uh, we, we, we have some natural hedge there uh, of, of having the localness played out very well in times of today too. So. Uh, so, in the, in what we have to have, though, that creates complexity. And we were challenged many times, hey, you should have huge factories uh, that uh, for, and then you have scale. In food business, your scale of your factory is quite uh, faster to get. I mean, a milk factory doesn't have to be, because also the milk comes fresh from, where, and so on. But um, uh, what, what we have to do is to manage well that complexity. And I think Nestle is one of these that, that find ways of managing that complexity. First, we don't have one structure to give answers to everything. There no one size fits all is not part of our credo. Uh, we are very flexible, we have different systems, and, and, and as decision making is pushed through the organization, there's no clutter. Uh, everybody goes about its own business model and works, or in its country and works, uh, but global inspiration and that is strategic direction. We have global business strategies for categories. We have brands that are managed centrally, had other regionally. Everybody knows where the place is. Everybody is motivated. Everybody is living up to the values. And that's how it works. Uh, we have quite a strong culture as a company. Helps through crises like this one, because virtual works well when you have a good, strong culture. Uh, you don't build culture virtually. Culture is done physically. So, uh, but we have that credit of culture that we serve during this pandemic. Uh, but it's time to build culture again somewhere. And uh, that's starting again, although the last weeks has given other flavors, but um, yeah. But that's how it goes. Global inspiration, local execution. Thank you very much, Mr. Bulke. Pleasure. For your Thank insights. You. And with this, I will really close here with announcing the next two uh, events from the CIAF. 23rd of November, Bertrand Picard, another sustainable pioneer and psychiatrist that you can listen to at the University of Zurich. And in cooperation with the Literaturhaus Zurich, Professor Dan Deiner, the German-Israeli historian, also on very interesting current issues. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for being online with us and see you soon at the next events. Thank you. <laughs>